Amid the vast expanse of our cosmos, our planet spins on its humble axis, a cosmic drama of epic proportions. Our Earth, a vibrant actor in this celestial theatre, boasts a dramatic history with some scenes still in the spotlight, the cataclysms of its supervolcanoes. Today we'll be taking a look at the five largest supervolcanic eruptions that we know of, all of which indelibly shape the tapestry of our planet's geological journey. Picture this, Utah, some 30 million years ago. What is now serene, rugged wilderness was once the epicenter of an explosive convulsion that shook the Earth to its very core. The star of this episode was the now inconspicuous Wawa Springs. But back then, it was anything but discreet. A colossal magma chamber, swollen to breaking point, erupted with a force beyond comprehension discharging a mind-boggling 5,500 cubic kilometers of magma in a single eruption. The landscape morphed into an ocean of fire and rock. The sky darkened with plumes of ash reaching the stratosphere, dispersing globally and impacting climates. The resultant caldera, now covered by the Wawa and Confusion Mountains, remains an enduring testament to nature's dramatic flair. As we venture towards the majestic peaks of Colorado's Rocky Mountains, we uncover the tale of the Lagarita Caldera. Approximately 27.8 million years ago, the land here bore witness to an eruption of unfathomable scale. The land shivered, a muffled rumble growing into a terrifying roar as an estimated 5,000 cubic kilometers of magma blasted into the sky. The repercussions were monumental, drastically altering the landscape while volcanic ash deadly and far-reaching, painted the sky a dark, ominous hue. Today, the region's geological richness, from the gold and silver veins threading through the San Juan volcanic field, remains the enduring legacy of this turbulent past. We now find ourselves amidst the tranquility of Sumatra in Indonesia, where the picturesque Lake Toba narrates a tale of incredible violence and change. Approximately 74,000 years ago, what is now a serene body of water was the heart of a catastrophic eruption, ejecting around 2,800 cubic kilometers of magma. Before the eruption, seismic activity would have increased dramatically, instilling dread in any living creature in proximity. Then, in a moment of earth-shattering release, the land exploded, sending plumes of ash miles high into the atmosphere. The ash fallout and resultant volcanic winter had a profound global impact, causing climatic shifts and affecting early human populations. Today, the site invites us to marvel at its placid beauty, starkly contrasting its chaotic past. I've covered Toba in past videos and you can find a link to that in the description below. Another supervolcano that we've covered and that you can also find a link to in the description below is Cerro Galan, which sees us journeying across the globe to the Andean highlands, where a silent behemoth bears the scars of an eruption that occurred approximately 2.1 million years ago, releasing a staggering 1,050 cubic kilometers of magma. Before the cataclysm, the ground shook with growing intensity, a prelude to the coming storm. And when it came, it was an explosive spectacle of nature's power reshaping the Andean landscape and throwing ash and gas high into the sky. These remnants have long since settled, leaving mineral treasures like lithium, a valuable resource in our modern world. Finally, we land at the geological jewel that is the Yellowstone National Park. A vibrant hotspot of geothermal activity, it conceals a volatile history. About 2.1 million years ago, its most violent outburst disgorged an incredible 2,500 cubic kilometers of magma. Even before the catastrophic eruption, Yellowstone would have been a geological maelstrom of quakes and eruptions. When the big one hit, it was an event of apocalyptic proportions. The landscape, seething and churning, spewing ash and debris miles into the sky. So we conclude our journey through time and space, having witnessed the earth-shaking drama of the most powerful volcanic events. Each supervolcano, a unique story of nature's raw power and grandeur. 
which shapes our world and continues to influence life's destiny on our incredible planet. Thanks for watching. In the heart of Victoria, where the air is crisp and the horizon is marked by snowy peaks, stands the revered Mount Buller Ski Resort. More than just a winter haven, this mountain cradles a tale woven over eons. This narrative captures the very essence of the Earth's geological ballet. Looming over the vast expanse of Victoria's highlands, an iconic part of the Alpine region, Mount Buller is not just a sentinel of the Great Dividing Range, it is also a silent witness to nature's fiery drama. Below its ski trails, beneath the powder and pine, lies a colossal secret. A sprawling batholith, the remnants of an ancient and mighty magma chamber. A chamber that was not merely a geological feature, but the very engine of a supervolcano that once roared and reshaped the contours of this land. This magma chamber's origin is a tale of Earth's plates in a fierce embrace. To the east, they collided and contorted in a dance of geological proportions. This dance, a subduction event, birthed the Buller Batholith and concurrently enriched the renowned Walhalla Goldfields, marrying fire with fortune. Imagine skiing atop a vast bed of granodiorite, its grains telling tales of eons past. This granodiorite is about 380 million years old, and it's hidden beneath snow and history. Because this very granodiorite was once the volatile fuel of a supervolcano. This supervolcano burst forth from a vulnerable point, a zone of weakness nudged by an older, wiser volcanic sill. But to truly understand Mount Buller's volcanic legacy, one must delve into its three-act saga. The opening act showcased torrents of andesitic lava flowing with majesty and might. Though their debut was explosive, it was merely a prelude to the symphony of fury that awaited. These initial eruptions, though awe-inspiring, were also treacherously dangerous, painting a vivid picture of nature's duality. Then, as if taking a breath, the mountain entered a deceptive interlude. The second act was marked by a dormant phase, a silence that belied the tumult brewing beneath. The andesite's sealing touch was but a temporary lid on a pot that was simmering with increased vigour. Deep within, the magma chamber underwent a transformation, a metamorphosis. It devoured surrounding continental rocks, growing richer and more volatile with silica. And then, with a crescendo of geological fury, the final act was unveiled. No longer could the chamber contain its rage. With an eruption that dwarfed all before, rhyolite surged forth in a cataclysmic display. The land was swallowed by tempestuous pyroclastic waves, rendering it a realm of death and desolation. This supervolcanic eruption was nature's magnum opus, leaving behind an indelible mark in the form of ring faults and a mysterious caldera that's visible alongside the batholith that fueled it. Today, this caldera whispers its secrets to those who listen, its presence echoing through the magmatic imprints of the land. So as you carve your way down Mount Buller's slopes, remember the symphony of fire and fury that once played below. For in the dance of ice and flame, Buller stands as an eternal testament to our planet's ever-evolving saga. Thanks for watching. In the heart of Sweden, a colossal scar lies hidden beneath forests and lakes. The Siljan Ring, a testament to a cataclysmic event from 377 million years ago. This ring tells a story of a time when the Earth was very different. During the late Devonian period, our planet was experiencing an evolutionary explosion. In the oceans, early sharks swam alongside armoured fish and corals, while on land, the first forests were emerging, and primitive amphibians began their tentative steps away from water. But amidst this burst of life, a dramatic event was about to unfold. A massive asteroid hurtling through space set its sights on Earth, colliding with what is now central Sweden. It unleashed a force so immense that it reshaped the landscape. Powerful shockwaves radiated outwards, leveling ancient forests and causing the ground to upheave. The intense heat set the world ablaze, and where the asteroid meant the sea, gigantic tsunamis surged forth. In this video, we'll take a look at Europe's largest impact site. You can find the article version as usual on our website by using a link in the description or by visiting ausgeographics.com. During the Devonian, the world was experiencing an explosion of biodiversity. 
However, in the vast expanse of the universe, an asteroid, a gargantuan chunk of rock and metal was hurtling towards our blue planet. Its trajectory was set, and a region that would one day be known as Sweden lay in its path. The Earth was a vastly different place back then. Vast seas stretched across the horizon, painting a blue canvas brimming with life. Early sharks with their primitive forms navigated the waters, whilst armoured fish glided through the ancient coral reefs. Above the water's surface, the first whispers of forests began to emerge. Primitive plants like lycopods and ferns danced with the wind, casting their shadows upon the nascent land. Amidst this backdrop of burgeoning life, an ominous shadow loomed. Days became a countdown, and the serene region destined to become Sweden was blissfully unaware of the celestial juggernaut hurtling toward it. When the day arrived, it was cataclysmic. The sky was pierced by the asteroid, and in a heartbeat, the land met with the fury of the cosmos. With a blinding flash and a deafening roar, the asteroid slammed into the Earth. The ground trembled with unimaginable force, sending shockwaves that tore through the landscape. The skies turned into an inferno, with fragments from the impact site being catapulted upwards only to rain down as molten projectiles. Forests were flattened in an instant, and the skies were set ablaze with the fiery fragments ejected from the impact site. The once tranquil seas were no refuge either. As the asteroid met the shallow marine environment, it birthed gargantuan tsunamis, waves of such magnitude that they dwarfed anything in living memory. These watery giants raced with abandon, consuming and reshaping everything in their path. In the wake of such devastation, the world was transformed. Where the asteroid had struck, a vast chasm, the Cilian Ring, marked the point of contact. The world was plunged into darkness as dust and debris, thrown up by the impact, shrouded the sun, obscuring it and casting the earth into a twilight gloom. Temperatures plummeted, and what was once a thriving ecosystem now faced a chilling quote-unquote impact winter, turning once fertile lands into frigid wastelands. The rains that followed were no ordinary showers. Laden with chemicals birthed from the fire and fury of the impact, they were potentially acidic, scalding the land and further challenging the resilience of the surviving life. Over time, life began to adapt and reclaim the scarred land. The very heart of the impact, the crater, slowly filled with water, giving birth to what we now know as Lake Cilion. This new aquatic haven became home to a myriad of species, each carving out an existence in the shadow of this cataclysmic event. In the deeper recesses of the crater, the intense heat and pressure from the asteroid's touch transformed the Earth's minerals. Shocked quartz, bearing the unique fingerprints of the impact, crystallized amidst the ruins. Deep fractures in the Earth whispered tales of potential oil and gas deposits, legacies of the asteroid's fiery embrace. The Cilian Ring, with its ancient scars and tales of cosmic fury, stands as a profound testament to the fragility and resilience of our planet. From the tranquil days of the late Devonian, to the cataclysm that reshaped a region, and onto the slow march of recovery, this story is a vivid reminder of Earth's ever-evolving narrative. It teaches us that even in the face of overwhelming adversity, life finds a way to endure, adapt, and thrive. As we reflect upon this monumental chapter in our planet's history, we are reminded of the intricate dance between chaos and order, destruction and renewal. The Cilian Ring is not just a geological marvel, it's a symbol of the indomitable spirit of life and the timeless saga of Earth's journey through the cosmos. Thanks for watching. 2019, the discovery of a new and thankfully extinct supervolcano that left a caldera twice the size of Yellowstone was made off the coast of the Philippines. Jenny Ann Barreto, a marine geologist, and her team found a caldera from an ancient explosive eruption that once occurred in the depths of the Philippine Sea, with it measuring a staggering 150 kilometers or 93 miles in diameter, making it the world's largest caldera. But how destructive would this eruption have been? And would a volcanic eruption at this scale be more or less deadlier compared to one that occurred on dry land? Which, as we all know, creates some intense and pretty harrowing effects to lands near and far from them when they occur. Because of its position, with this eruption and the subsequent caldera collapse, did mega tsunamis or tsunamis in general get triggered? We're going to answer all of these questions and more 
as we take a look into the life and eventual death of the now extinct Apalaki supervolcano. The Apalaki caldera is located in an area that's referred to as a large igneous province. A large igneous province, or LIP, are massive areas of relatively short but seemingly non-stop volcanic eruptions that are fueled by a hotspot, meaning some kind of mantle plume is occurring here, which essentially translates to the occurrence of an upwelling of an abnormal amount of magma that's rising on mass from the mantle. These processes are unrelated to typical tectonic related volcanism and are still an area where more study is needed to ascertain the actual hows and whys behind their existence. But even though they're odd and we lack understanding of them, they're actually quite common and there's many of them all around the globe. So what we had here was some kind of abnormality in terms of the voluminous amount of magma that formed the Benham Rise, but fuel it, it did. And this area saw its first eruptions begin around 48 million years ago, before finally calling it quits around 26 million years ago. There's been a multi-phase volcanic history in the life of the Apalaki volcanic complex. Hotspot volcanism more or less gushes forth basaltic magma from the mantle in a spectacular fashion. So the first eruptions here were non-explosive. The release of a huge amount of basaltic lava occurred on the deep ocean floor creating pillow lavas and eventually, over many millions of years, it would build up the height of the Benham Rise. But in general, the study has split the history of this volcanic complex into three stages. The shield building phase, which we just mentioned with the non-stop flow of basaltic lava, followed by the caldera formation and post-caldera late stage volcanism. It's important to mention that at its birth, the Benham Rise began at a depth of 5.2 kilometers or 3.2 miles in the deep ocean floor. Subsequent basaltic eruptions built the rise up by 2.7 kilometers or 1.6 miles over the course of about 6 million years, leaving it submerged by about 2.5 kilometers or 1.5 miles at its crest. So in the course of about 6 million years, the eruptions turned from effusive to much more explosive, and the present day massive caldera occurred at some point before 41.3 to 41.5 million years ago. Bathymetric data revealed it's a complex structure with multiple collapse events that occurred here, with many ring faults aiding the collapse, meaning these eruptions got so intense that it fractured the surrounding land to the point of forming their own faults. We've seen this occur in a supervolcano in Australia. Actually, there's multiple ring dike fault systems formed by the many supervolcanic eruptions that occurred here, and the majority of them were entirely separate volcanic bodies. But in the Apalaki caldera, it's clear that volcanic activity continued time and time again because in its final stages, after the last major collapse occurred, we see little resurgent domes and post-caldera activity before the magma here finally went cold and solidified as the system here shut down for good. So what happened here? Why did the eruptions suddenly get so explosive? Well, there was about 2.5 kilometers or 1.6 miles worth of what could essentially be deemed a volcanic cap sitting above the points where the magma first flowed meaning magma got trapped inside the ground for longer, leading to more melt occurring and aiding in any potential chemistry changes. And now the surprising news is that these types of supervolcanic eruptions that occur deep in the ocean would actually do very little to affect our surface dwellers. It'd completely destroy the surrounding ecosystem temporarily due to the volatiles that this eruption would release, but because of how deep it actually is, it's very unlikely that it'd do any real damage beyond this. Don't get me wrong, if a supervolcanic eruption and subsequent caldera collapse occurred in a shallow sea, then the damage would be very, very bad and tsunamis of a terrifying size would accompany it, as history has shown us time and time again. But the eruptions that form them are always magnitudes below the type of eruption we are discussing here, which is one at a supervolcanic scale. But the deep sea completely messes around with things, especially the ash cloud, so fallout, nuclear winters, all of that scary stuff really shouldn't and probably wouldn't happen here, and neither would a massive tsunami. There'd be some displacement of water during the cold era collapse, but it's unlikely it'd be anything too bad in all honesty, and the area of displacement is largely confined. So thankfully, the largest cold era on our planet occurred deep, deep below the ocean. But rest in peace to all the fishes that were unlucky enough to be caught up in it. Now, just because this supervolcano popped off deep below the sea, doesn't mean there wasn't hell here. Pyroclastic flows still occurred, lava flows still raged post caldera collapse, and this area would have been a terrifying place to be chilling when this guy threw a fit. 
but he burped his last volcanic bomb about 26 million years ago. And now all that remains is this truly incredible freak size caldera. The fishes can now rest easy. Thanks for watching. In the northernmost tip of our planet, within an area of ocean located only a short distance away from the tundras and boreal forests that dominate the Arctic, the crust of the Earth is literally tearing itself apart. This is the Arctic Mid-Ocean Ridge, and this is the area that marks the line where two massive tectonic plates are literally tearing apart from one another. But in this mid-ocean ridge, we have something rather peculiar occurring. For some reason, one of the largest supervolcanoes that we've ever discovered erupted here quite recently, with it occurring around 1 million years ago. This is strange. Mid-ocean rift zones are never associated with explosive volcanoes of this calibre, making this the first time we've ever really found something like this. I mean, this supervolcano released an eruption that was literally larger than the Lake Toba super eruption that occurred some 75,000 years ago. And not only was this eruption dramatically large, but researchers said, and I quote, we consider the described caldera as an evidence of some new form of volcanism related to this type of plate boundary, meaning this volcano seems to have rewritten the rules of volcanology. These types of events form something known as a rift zone, and rift zones are unsurprisingly very hostile environments to be near when they are active. They can occur in the ocean, like this one did, or on dry land, like the one that's currently forming in East Africa. If this supervolcano existed in a continental rift zone, I wouldn't be surprised at all that an explosive supervolcano formed. But since it formed in an oceanic rift zone, this raises so many questions. So in this video we're going to touch on that and more, as we endeavour to find the answers to several questions that I have about this supervolcano. From how large the eruption was, to why it occurred in the first place, in the middle of an oceanic rift zone. And I'll also touch more on why it's so strange that this happened here in the first place. The two plates responsible for forming the supervolcano in this discussion are the North American and Eurasian plates, which are moving away from each other at a very slow rate. I'll come back to this fact later on. The area where we can find this supervolcano is called the Gackle Ridge, and to no one's surprise, the eruption centre itself is called the Gackle Ridge Caldera as a result of this. This entire depression here is actually the caldera. This volcano is actually still active, and it last erupted around a million years ago, so it's currently priming for its next major eruption right now as you watch this video. So back to the tectonic event that's fueling it. These kinds of rift events are more formally known as divergent plate boundaries. And as you can probably imagine, the fact that two major pieces of crust that were once sutured together are suddenly ripping apart is creating the perfect environment for pronounced weaknesses in the land to form, as the crust here thins ever more as this stretch continues, creating major faulting and fracturing to the rocks that line it in the process. When this occurs, magma readily rises from the Earth's mantle due to buoyancy to fill the ever-expanding voids, utilising the newly formed fault lines as a conduit to do so. When magma does this in an oceanic setting, the results are usually major lava flows and volcanoes that erupt in a similar fashion to how Hawaiian and Icelandic volcanoes do, with low explosive but highly effusive eruptions that pour a voluminous amount of mafic magma out, and in this case it does so on the ocean floor. The reason these lava flows aren't normally explosive is because the magma itself stays true to its chemical origin, meaning as it rises from the mantle it doesn't really change in its chemical composition all that much as it makes its journey upwards, and it remains as a magma that's low in silica and is mafic in its origin, meaning it's high in magnesium and iron. But to keep this simplified, we'll refer to these rocks as basalt, even though there are several other mafic rocks but basalt is the most common. So basalt rises from the Earth's mantle and erupts as lava on the ocean floor. But if this happens in a continental section of land, such as what is occurring in East Africa, then things are far more dangerous. Because as magma rises from the mantle, it will melt the rocks that line the crust of the East African landmass as it ascends, 
And when it settles in the magma chamber, it'll do much of the same, with the magma melting the rocks lining the walls of the chamber. The reason this is bad is because continental rocks are normally high in silica, so when this low silica magma from the Earth's mantle rises, it makes contact with these high silica continental rocks, and readily melts them and incorporates them into its own chemical composition, leading to a marked rise in the level of silica within the magma, creating the conditions necessary for major explosive volcanic eruptions to occur, because viscous magma has the ability to trap in volatile gases which, in turn, increase the pressure levels of a magma chamber, and this will lead to very dangerous explosive volcanic eruptions, and to the formation of supervolcanoes. East Africa will, in the not too distant future, be the most dangerous part of the planet to live in, as it will be dotted by major volcanoes, and the next wave of supervolcanoes will be forming there, mark my words. So now you know why it's so unusual to see an explosive volcano existing here and why it's even more weird that it's not just some explosive volcano, it's actually one of the largest super eruptions that we've found thus far on our planet, and it's been documented quite well, as the studies that are backing it are very thorough. So the Gackle Ridge is the name given to the rift zone, and the Gackle Ridge caldera erupted around 1.1 million years ago, with an estimated eruptive volume of 3,000 cubic kilometers or 720 cubic miles, making it one of the most explosive volcanoes on Earth to have occurred during the Pleistocene, which to clarify is the geological period spanning from 2.58 million years ago to 11,700 years ago. And as previously mentioned, it's amazing because it's the only known supervolcano located directly on a mid-ocean ridge. The caldera is an impressive 80 kilometers or 49 miles long by 40 kilometers or 25 miles wide. And the caldera has a depth of 1200 meters or 3937 feet, making it quite shallow in all honesty, which is bad, because that means when this absolute monster of a volcano erupted, the ash cloud went subaerial, meaning the plume more than likely exited the surface of the ocean and soared up towards the stratosphere, creating a volcanic winter in the process. The generation of a tsunami is possible as well, considering the strength this eruption reached and the amount of material that was released during it. Thin layers of volcanic material that were blasted from the vent were found as far as 1,000 kilometers or 621 miles away from the Gackle Ridge. But this isn't the only eruption that's occurred here. There's others that were released from the Gackle Volcano, but the one we are focusing on is by far the most powerful. It was so strong that it might have affected the actual spreading geometry of the eastern part of the Eurasian Basin. In present day, hydrothermal vents line the caldera, showing the fact that it's still very much alive and working hard within some cavernous batholith that's lying beneath the sea floor. But attempting to ascertain how this volcano formed to begin with is what fascinates me the most. We have some variables. Perhaps the best variable in this situation that can to some part explain what we see is the fact that this rift zone is the slowest to spread by a long shot when compared to other divergent plate boundaries on our planet, with it moving at a snail-like rate of under 1 cm per year. Compare that to the 4 to 10 cm that typical rift zones move at per year and you can see where I'm going here. There's a chance that magma is just becoming more confined and is pressurizing because of this. But there's also another variable, and that's the fact that this part of the crust and mantle are very cold. Earthquakes have also been detected at Gackle that originate from the mantle, which is very unusual to witness in a mid-ocean ridge. Gaps in volcanic activity occur here, most likely as a result of the aforementioned factors, and it appears that these occurrences are what may explain the majority of the Gackle supervolcano's existence, but more research needs to be done. Before we conclude, there's one more fact that I find fascinating about the Gackle supervolcano. Not only is it the only known supervolcano to exist in a mid-ocean ridge, it's also the only one that's known to erupt at a supervolcanic scale, from a magmatic fuel consisting of basalt and andesite, which are low silica rocks. Now that's some crazy stuff. I believe there's a correlation between the low temperature of the mantle and crust and the magma itself that's creating the conditions necessary for the explosivity witnessed here. This is just my opinion, 
But it's the situation that makes the most sense to me. Because even though silica is the primary factor that's responsible for the viscosity of magma, an often overlooked variable is temperature, which can also play a role in viscosity. Basaltic magma is the hottest magma known to exist. But if there's something that's actively working to cool it, as it rises, it's going to naturally lower in temperature and become more viscous as a result. And this might serve to explain why cackle exists. But I'm sure we'll know one day if there's any truth in my hypothesis. And this is why I love geology. There's no real hard or fast rules in this science. There's always some outlier, or some variable, that serves to completely baffle and contradict what we know. It's a science that's filled with adventure, and that's why I'm so obsessed with it. It's a constant game of discovery to me, and the Gackle Ridge Caldera serves as a prime example of something that we really wouldn't have expected to exist. And yet, here it is. Thanks for watching. Over 1.8 billion years ago, a massive event occurred in our solar system. An asteroid about 10 to 15 kilometers, or 6 to 9 miles across, ended its journey through space in a dramatic collision with Earth. This impact created what we now know as the Sudbury Basin in Ontario, Canada, turning it into a geological marvel. This ancient event laid the groundwork for one of the world's most affluent mineral areas. Today we're going to explore this fascinating chapter of Earth's history, from the catastrophic impact to its influence on the land's geology, and how the remnants of this ancient asteroid continue to shape our world and society. And as usual, you can also find this in article form on my website ozgeographics.com, or follow the direct link in the description. Join us as we travel back in time to uncover the transformative power of this event. The asteroid's approach would have been a spectacle in the sky, visible for days or weeks before the impact. The asteroid's entry into the Earth's atmosphere would have created a brilliant fireball, lighting the sky with an intense glow. Life existed in its most basic forms, but if observers on the ground did exist back then, they might have seen a bright streak across the sky as the asteroid hurtled towards its collision point. As previously mentioned, the asteroid, which was around 10 to 15 kilometers or 6 to 9 miles in diameter, collided with Earth during the Paleoproterozoic era, some 1.8 billion years ago. The impact site, now known as the Sudbury Basin, was transformed into a fiery cauldron, a temporary lava lake with temperatures high enough to melt rock. The original crater was estimated to be around 250 kilometers or 155 miles in diameter, a vast wound on the Earth's surface. Today, the basin measures approximately 60 by 30 kilometers or 37 by 18.6 miles. The impact created multiple rings, a feature often found in large impact craters on moons and planets throughout our solar system. I made a video on some of the largest impact craters that exist in our solar system, and many of them had this multiple ring feature. The force of the collision would have been felt far and wide, in fact it would have been felt planet wide, with shockwaves radiating outwards, destroying everything in their wake, and the earthquake that was produced would have been one of the largest that have ever occurred in our planet's history. The moment of impact would have been cataclysmic. The ground would have shaken violently, and a massive explosion would have sent debris flying for hundreds of kilometers. The heat and pressure would have been so intense that rocks melted, and the landscape was obviously forever altered. A shockwave would have spread out from the impact site, creating tsunamis in any nearby bodies of water. The sky would have been filled with dust and debris, blocking the sun and creating a temporary quote-unquote impact winter. One of the most harrowing consequences of an enormous asteroid impact is the phenomenon that occurs as ejected debris re-enters the Earth's atmosphere. This debris, traveling at incredible speeds, superheats the atmosphere within minutes or even seconds. The temperatures can soar to levels higher than the surface of the Sun, reaching several thousand degrees Celsius. This isn't a slow or localized event, it's an instantaneous global catastrophe. The entire planet becomes engulfed in a searing heat wave. This intense heat would literally sterilize everything. After the impact, a central uplift dome remained. This occurred when the Earth's crust, compressed by the force of the impact, bounces back, creating a dome-like structure in the crater's center. This dome is a characteristic feature of large impact events and is still visible in the Sudbury Basin. 
The surrounding area would have experienced significant geological changes, including faulting, folding and the creation of new metamorphic rock formations. The landscape would have been scarred and reshaped, with pristine mountains, valleys and lakes forming due to the immense forces unleashed. Now, an interesting process unfolded as the Earth began to recover from this event. The intense heat from the impact melted a large part of the Earth's crust, creating a pool of molten rock and metal. As it cooled, heavier elements like nickel, platinum, gold and copper sank, while lighter minerals floated to the top. This process, known as magmatic differentiation, led to the formation of concentrated metal deposits that exist in layers, which is a dream for someone like me, who loves this kind of stuff. Over time, these deposits became part of the Sudbury Igneous Complex, now the world's largest source of magmatic nickel. More than $1 billion worth of metal ores are extracted each year from this region. The complex comprises several types of rocks, including norite, quartz gabbro, and granophyre. Now, we've already made a video on the largest impact site on Earth, which is located in South Africa, link to that in the description below, and this underwent a similar mineralization process, and as a result of this massive asteroid impact which occurred only 200 million years before this one, led to the formation of the world's largest gold deposits. The story of the Sudbury Basin is a vivid reminder of these types of catastrophic events. And even though it occurred billions of years ago, it still continues to shape our world and society in significant ways. From the chaos of an ancient asteroid impact, valuable resources were formed. Resources that have fueled human progress for centuries. Thank you for joining us on this exploration of one of Earth's most intriguing geological events. The Sudbury Basin's story is a testament to the interconnectedness of our universe and the enduring influence of space events on our daily lives. Thanks for watching.